Take your Bible and go with us to the book of Matthew chapter 26 this morning. Matthew chapter 26. We welcome Brother Bob Valier to our service, a lifelong friend of our church and our people. And uh, he has a very unique calling in ministry. He's developed to be one great preacher over these years. And he does a great job in everything he does for the Lord, but primarily his calling and focus is on assisting and helping pastors and missionaries and churches. And so he comes in churches like ours, like he has for us now for, I guess, close to 30 years, if not 30 years. And he audits our books and goes through our books. And I've always just wanted that to happen from the very beginning. And it protects everybody involved. So it's a, it's a good move, and we've enjoyed him. He also uh, is a help to those that have maybe questions relating to finance. He doesn't do taxes, personal taxes, but, but he, has, he has the answers. He deals with it so much, and uh, he's just a tremendous blessing. And uh, he told this morning in a prayer meeting with the men about the, uh, one of the missionaries on, in Africa that uh, their monies, he's an American missionary, their monies have been frozen and seized and leaves that man destitute in that country. And so he helps with more than 500 missionaries in doing their taxes in this country, in this land. And so he's a great guy. And if you can use him this week, work the feathers out of him. Just work him. Amen. He does stop to eat once in a while. And he likes to run around the parking lot in the morning early. I always stay and watch him lap the building. You know, it's keep security guard for him and watch him. But... Uh, we're glad for Brother Val, your lifelong friend. If he can be a help this week, be sure and call the office. Amen. The book of Matthew, chapter number 26 this morning. On Easter Sunday morning, it's going to be a great morning. This hope will be with us in concert. Our choir will be joining them together, singing together. So you want to bring some nails and nail your shoes down, your feet down, because you'll want to lift them up and run a while. It'll be a good service, and so we're looking forward to it. And we encourage you to invite four people. We call it four by four. Find four people you can pray for and attempt to bring those four people on Easter. And so I say that, but, but there's such an amazing need, such an amazing need. When 83% of the people in America say that they're invited to, by a friend, they'd most likely come to visit with them in church. It puts a lot of responsibility on you and I to be that person that cares about their soul. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 36. Matthew 26, verse 36. I begin by saying before we read that we're talking about Jesus being alive. and He was alive to receive our love, Mary, in the city of Bethany, as she made her offering. He was alive to give instructions to Peter and tell him that his strength was not enough. Peter, you are not ready without my power. And he said, yeah, Lord, I, I've got it. I'll go all the way to death with you. And the Lord said, no, no. Peter, you don't understand. Satan has a plan, and he wants to shake the feathers out of you, man. He wants to shift, sift you as wheat. And uh, Peter didn't do so well. He's alive. And you find that in this Matthew chapter 26, in these two chapters, we find that it contains six days contains, my friend, the story of those six days leading up, if you please, to the crucifixion and the resurrection. So in Matthew 26, verse number 1, it starts six days before, and then, of course, nine days from the resurrection. So there's going to be a big bunch happening, and if you're a student of God's Word, and I pray you are, that, that you kind of get a hold of this, and uh, you'll see what happens. Um, we... Uh, we find some things are going to happen, and let me just share with you what they are. First of all, you find a love that, that only we can give, that's Mary. You find a power that he didn't have, that was Peter. And this morning, a cup that only he can drink. That's where we're going to be at this morning, a cup that only he can drink. And then the counterfeits and the real thing. Uh, that's interesting, Judas Iscariot. Walking in the unknown, walking in darkness. Others besides us, tonight, my message famous last words, the saying of the Savior. And of course, the wonderful message, he's just not here, amen. He's just not here. But he's coming back, amen. He's just not here, he's coming back. And so the progress of these last days we find in ours 
very fascinating and, amaz and amazing as we see the story unfold. But allow me this morning to go with you in God's word. I pray you'll be hungry for God's word. I pray you'll be hungry for our Lord's word. I pray that you'll do everything you can to grasp the truths of the word of God. There's plenty of preachers that could do better with the exhortation of text than I can do, but there's not a better word than, than I have and you have in our hand. There's just not a better word. And there's enough in it that, my friend, it, it just literally will transform our lives. So we're going to begin our read now. As we begin in verse number 36, I want you to get this in your mind now. We're probably at Thursday. We're Thursday. Sunday's the resurrection. Probably at Thursday. The Bible said these words, And then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. They just crossed the brook of Kedron, very familiar small brook. Interesting, they use the words, they came unto a place. A place. Man, they're there. It's called Gethsemane. He said unto his disciples, Set ye here while I go yonder and pray. Eight of them sets down. One of them's gone. Judas Iscariot's gone, right? Right? Got 12 to start with, right? One's gone. That makes 11. He's going to take three with him. And leave eight of them behind. Said, you boys, just take a rest. You just take a rest. The guys have been busy. Had a long day. You got a long night. A lot's going to happen tomorrow. You guys got a lot of running to do tomorrow, boys. Eight of you guys sat here and rest. I'm going to take three with me. I'm going to take them someplace that they're very privileged to go. Here's what it said. Say ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Strong words, not heavy, very heavy. Something that he had a hard time holding on to and holding up to. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. So now the eight have been set to rest. The three, Peter, James, and John, are different. Come with me. You guys tarry here. But I don't want you guys to watch. I don't want you to sleep. I want you to watch. I want you to watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on, on his face. The other gospel accounts that record the same event say that he went a stone's throw, that he fell on his face. Other gospel accounts that he fell to his knees and then onto his face. And he was praying, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. As always, a fresh and a full surrender, when he come to these things in life that he didn't have strength for. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep. That's Peter, James, and John. We don't know that he went back to the other eight. We just come Peter, James, and John. That's all he goes back to. You guys, go ahead and sleep. Go on to sleep, rest. You've got a full day, man. A lot's going to be happening. You don't know it, but there's a lot ahead. And he said unto Peter, what? What, Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now notice carefully for the Bible student that it describes the length of that prayer and this time that he spent with God. We know the exact verbiage of his prayer, but the length of time it took him to make that prayer was very interesting. I've been gone one hour, boys, and I come back and you guys have fallen Plumb to sleep. Verse 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went again the second time and prayed, saying, oh, my father, the same words. Notice the word, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them again asleep, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now. 
Go ahead, guys. Peter, James, and John, sleep on now. And take your rest, because the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. My message this morning will be very short and brief, and you'll have to listen closer, you'll miss it. My introduction and the foundation of the message is important, but what I want to talk about when we get to the cup is where I want my message to be. Few times are we privileged to hear the prayer of Jesus to his Father. We find many times that he leaves his disciples, he sends the multitudes away, and he goes alone to pray. The Bible declares that, that he goes alone to pray. Sometimes we see him as, we, as he fades away into the mountains. And he just disappears seemingly into nowhere. And we know nothing about his prayer. We know nothing about what is happening. Sometimes when he prays, he prays publicly so, so everybody can hear. Sometimes he says, the reason of my prayers is so that they might know that you're my father and I talk to you and that's why we're getting this job done. But this time it's very unique and different. Because this time, it's a prayer It's a prayer that the Savior makes all alone with his Father. We've been given the model prayer. Our Father which art heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those that sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil, for not is the power and the glory forever. And amen. That's the model prayer. The world and religion will tell us, my friend, that that's the Lord's prayer. That is not the Lord's prayer. That's the model prayer that he taught the disciples when they asked him about how to pray. But here is the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer. As I've got this cup, Lord, do I need to drink it? It's very interesting as we're invited to hear. Few prayers, my friends, as the Father let us listen to when he's alone with his Son. But the Father wants us to hear this one. He records it in every gospel. He gives the word and he gives a time. He gives a location. He gives a speaker. And so this morning I'd invite you to walk with me. Walk with me in a place that's very holy. All the apostles, my friend, were not even welcomed there. Only the three, Peter, James, and John, that seen the glory and the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ were invited to this occasion, perhaps to overcome, my friend, what they're going to watch and what they're going to see as this Son of God now, my friend, goes and talks with his Father. So I'd say to you, walk careful with me and softly. Turn off your phone so you don't even feel the vibration when a text would come in. Although the, all the apostles were not there with him, it's very interesting, my friend, that my friend, that we've been invited by the word of God to see and hear what must happen. You know, we must not intrude, but we must be very careful. I would suggest to you that when we come into the presence of this prayer, that very softly we listen to the heart of our Savior. I plead with you to be quiet as you sit and you watch and you listen. Because this prayer was not a prayer of fear of death or dying. Our Savior was not afraid of death or dying. Therefore, my Father does love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. Oh, the father knew exactly where the son was coming and what he was talking to him about. This prayer wasn't a prayer of being fearful of death. The cross did not scare him. The cross, the, the, the crown of thorns didn't bother him. The, the, the spear in the side when the water and blood gushed out beneath, beneath the ribs, Brother Roy, it didn't bother him. The nails didn't bother him. He didn't even squiggle, my friend, when they put those nails in his hands the size of railroad spikes. It didn't bother him. He was not praying about being stripped. He wasn't praying about being exposed in his nakedness. He 
He was talking about the cup. The cup. This cup that he talks about. I'm reading in Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 44, and I'm just going to go there for a minute. But I want you to see this cup as he prays. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's interesting, my friend, that it tells us, my friend, that an angel came from heaven and ministered unto Jesus in this time and in this hour of prayer. That an angel came to strengthen him in the midst of this time of prayer. Very interesting. Very powerful. Understand with me, this great anguish, my friend, was only exposed, my friend, to those, my friend, that had already seen the Lord in all of his glory, transfigured before him. It was interesting, my friend, that it was only Peter and James could John could experience some of what was happening. I prayed with the family in a serious condition here some days ago, and it's very interesting as we put our hands together at this altar, actually, at that altar at this side. And the hands of that family were gathered together, and as we went around, I could feel, I could feel the warm teardrops coming from the lady's eyes as she was praying. The Bible said when he prayed, his sweat, now this one, this is very, very interesting. The Bible said that his sweat was as if it was drops of blood. Very interesting. I want you to know, my friend, that it was an anguish prayer. It was a prayer, my friend, that was, uh, that was filled, my friend, with all of his being. Have you ever come to the Lord with a prayer and you came to, in such a way, my friend, that, that you were entering and you're going down to the bottom of your heart? When you're going down, my friend, to the bottom of all of your strength and you're bringing your prayer to the Lord and you're laying that out as you have never gone that deep and that far down in you when you've really prayed for someone to be saved or someone to be healed. Have you ever been there? It's interesting, my friend, that he must go alone there. It's very interesting that uh, Brother Fred Adams tells a story of his mother-in-law dying and she was in that process of passing and she called her family and Fred Adams, of course, is our deaf missionary. And Fred said that he was there in the room and it, she called all of her family and she has just one daughter alive, Sherry, that's Brother Adams, uh, Brother Adams' wife, and called in and asked Fred that, that he, she would pass and she would pass quickly. And she'd kind of go off a little while, then she'd come back and she'd say, Freddie, she calls him Freddie, 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 where are you? She said, he to, as he told me, he said, you know, she... She would say, Freddie, you prayed and I'm still here. How come I'm still here, Freddie? How come I'm still here? And then she'd slip off again and wake up and realize that she said, she said, Freddie, you prayed. How come I'm still here? And then she'd call off her daughter's name and want to know her daughter and her grandchildren. Where are they at? It's very interesting when a person's in deep anguish or even the, in the process of getting close to heaven, uh, though their loved ones cannot do anything for them, they just want them to be there. They just want somebody there that loves them. We watched Shuggy's mama pass here just a few weeks ago. Now, and she was calling for her, for her oldest sister that cared for her. And she cried out for Evelyn. Where is Evelyn? She was looking for Evelyn, the one that cared for her when she was a little girl and growing up. It's interesting that Jesus brought with him Peter and James and John, not the other eight. He only brought Peter, James, and John, those that, my friend, in the process of his of his of his preparation, my friend, for his death, he wanted those to be close with him. You know, it was so with Jesus that when he was in the process of going that he wanted those that were closest to him to be close by him. And then, then he uses by his own choice the word cup. You know, the Savior could use any word that he would, but he uses the word cup. It's very interesting. But he chose the word himself. And the Father didn't give him the word that he chose as he was thinking about what he was going through to understand for us an object, a cup. Now, this is probably bigger than a cup. Uh, I guess it would be called a jug. I'm not exactly sure. But, but the cup that he used, my friend, was a vessel, and it was very interesting. And uh, the cups probably didn't have handles on them. Some of them did, did in that era of time. But the cup probably wasn't as big as this. And when he talked about this cup, he talked about this cup, my friend, that, um, that he'd wanted to pass if there any way possible for, for it to pass. It was a choice of the words of Jesus. It was a container. It was something, my friend, that he would drink of. 
was something, my friend, that one person could consume. Could, could consume. You know, I, I don't know if I could, if that was filled with a liquid, I'm not so sure I could drink that all at one time. Amen? I don't think I could. Uh, Brother Missionary, hold up that little bottle of water down there. Won't you do that? Now, I could probably drink about, I drank about almost all of that before I got ready this morning here. But I don't know that maybe some of us could, but Jesus said, now, the object I want you to understand I'm praying about, I'm praying about this cup. What is it? What is this cup? It's something, my friend, that contains something. If it's a container, my friend, there would be a time and there would be a place, my friend, that he would drink it and he'd drink all of it. And that which was in that cup now, my friend, would be in him. And he chose for us to have a visual picture and a visual understanding of who he was and what he was going to do. You know, what's interesting, these things, as we think about, first of all, my friend, what I know about this cup was. This cup, my friend, was for the sins of men. I want you to know some things about the sins of men. First of all, the sins of men are known. The sins of men are known. Your sins and my sins are known. We try to keep them as quiet as we can, amen? We don't want anybody to know about them, amen? I don't want you to know about my sin, and I don't, by the way, I don't want to know about your sin, amen? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's always good to know them things. I don't think it's good. I don't. I don't think it's the right direction to go. But what I want you to know, and what I believe is, my friend, that if there'd be any one of us at random, my friend, we picked off, and all of a sudden, your picture would show up there, and all the things that went through your head, and all the things that went through your heart, and all the things that you'd done with your hands, I'd want you to know that, my friend, we'd all quickly say, listen, I'll pass. I just want to confess. I don't want any evidence. Don't show anybody what I've done. I'm a sinner. And everybody said what? Amen? Amen. Very interesting. As we begin to think about this cup, first of all, I want you to know that the sins of men are going to be placed in this cup. But first of all, I want you to know they're known. And God saw the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. The book of Genesis as well, chapter 18 and verse number 20 and 21. It's very interesting as the Angels have been sent from heaven. And it talks about the Lord, Sodom and Gomorrah and coming down to see, and God came down to see and to look at Sodom and Gomorrah. What I want you to know, first of all, about this cup, number one is, my friend, the sins of men are known. Amen? The sins of men are known. Number two, the sins of men are gathered to be placed in this cup. So with one hand, understand with me, with one hand, my friend, our God, my friend, goes back to that Garden of Eden and gathers a sin, the first sin of Adam and Eve, and takes both of their sins as they started out, and then all the sins of all their life, and he gathers those sins with one sweep from all the men and women that ever lived before. He brings together, my friend, on one side, my friend, all the sins of mankind, and he brings it to this place, my friend, of the cross. And with the other hand, my friend, our eternal Father and our sovereign God, all-knowing God, reaches, my friend, to the last man and the last woman that'll ever be alive and the last man and the last woman that'll ever bring breath. And he takes their sins, and with this hand, he sweeps with one sweep, my friend, he gathers together all the sins of mankind from, my friend, from the cross on forward. My, my sins are about from this time of drinking the cup about 2,000 years, Amen. 2018. So watch. So here's the cross and here's the cup. And so here's where we are today. And God reaches down. Thank God that he did. And he reached and he took my sins and he brought my sins and he gathered them together, my friend, to do something with the cup. And what Jesus is praying about, my friend, is about the cup. I can take the death. I can take the cross. I can take the spittle. I can take the, the beatings. I can take the cat of nine thousand. But the cup for God's son to consider even the very thought or the touch of sin on his life. A holy, eternal being. He said the cup. They're gathered. Our sins are known. Our sins are gathered, gathered my friend. But then, then they're poured into Christ. The heavenly father took our sins and he placed them in a cup. It was interesting, my friend, that when Peter had cut the servant's high priest ear off, the right ear, it says, it's very interesting that Jesus said to Peter, after getting him to put away the sword, because Peter probably would have cleaned the house, amen? I kind of like that guy, don't you? He said, which one of you boys are next? Amen, that's in the lamb version, by the way, amen? Anybody next? Anybody want to reach for my savior? 
Step on up anytime you want. Hey, hey, by the way, boys, I was shooting for the right ear. I wasn't shooting for the left ear. And if I want to get both of them in one pile, I just cut it off right here and picked them both up by the hair. It's not a problem for me. And, and Peter's that kind of guy that would have done it. Amen? Very interesting. My friend, that the Father has taken all of those sins and placed them in that cup. But now something else was going to happen. This cup was going to be poured into Christ. Peter said, shall I, shall I not drink of the cup that my Father giveth on, has given unto me? It's very interesting, the word hath even. He said, shall I not drink of the cup that my Father has given unto me? So on that cross in the time of darkness from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, my friend, it's when the Father turned his back and the sins, my friend, of the, all mankind had been placed, my friend, of the Savior, and they poured into him. And the Heavenly Father, my friend, poured, my friend, and held the cup of the Son as that one that knew no sin became sin for us. And he drank it, and he drank it, and he drank it until literally he drank all of it. He who knew no sin now has become sin for us. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. All the sins of the mankind, my friend, were placed, my friend, in the Savior. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, the scripture says. That he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In other words, he took all of the sin of all of mankind and placed in the cup, and he took upon himself by the sins of the whole world. For he is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world world. Understand with me, I can remember the first time that truth got in my head, that my friend, that Jesus paid the sin for all of the unsaved people as well. All the sins, my friend, of the people, my friend, that are in eternal hell, my friend, had already been paid for. They were just unwilling to accept him. They're unwilling, my friend, to receive what he has done. They were unwilling to do, my friend, what they needed to do as their responsibility. This cup, the sins of men were paid for. The sins of men, my friend, was made an offering for us so that we can be saved. And then lastly and completely, our sins are gone. Now, now, this is not the cup, as you know. But I want you to know that when the Father put those sins in that cup and Jesus drank of it, he drank all of it, my friend. All of our sins are, are gone. I like to go to that restaurant when they have them malts that are so thick, and so when they deliver it to your table, they turn them upside down so they make sure, so you can be sure they'll not come out. Have you ever been one of those places? Can I say there's nothing in there? You say, what about Dan Lamb? They were all in the cup. And he took it upon himself, and he drank it, and there's nothing in there now. There's nothing in there, not because I'm better than you, not because I'm better than anybody. The fact is, my friend, that I'm just wise enough to receive Jesus as my Lord and Jesus as my Savior. You say, you know what? If I get saved and if I hold on Jesus hard enough and long enough, I will be saved. Can I say, my friend, that when you get saved and you come to Jesus and you take a hold of him, he starts holding on to you, man. <laughs> Jesus grabs a hold of you said, I've taken you, put you in my father's hand, and nobody's able to get you out. Old black man was preaching about that, and he got talking about it, got carried away, and he got talking about being in the father's hand, and he talked about being in the father's hand, and if somehow somebody had so much strength they could break loose the father's hand, and then break loose the son, and bro break loose the Holy Spirit. He said, if, if somebody's that strong, which there is not, but if he could overpower the father and the son, the Holy Spirit, he'd be so weak I could whoop him myself, amen? Yeah, buddy. You won't need to whip them because Jesus already paid for it. Amen? Can you say amen with me? Amen. Our sins are known. Our sins are gathered. Our sins are poured. Our sins are paid for. And our sins are gone. Amen. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Gone. Now think about that. Gone. Gone. The U.S. Department of Justice published a book some time ago. It was a 100-page book. It had a title on it that none of us will ever want to read. 
but the title of it was When Your Child is Missing. And in that book, it had several divisions and chapters. Some of the chapters went like this. First of all, the first one is you're not alone when your child is missing. Hope is essential. Trust your feelings and share them with law enforcement. Distribute pictures. Keep your focus. Exercise caution. And then lastly, the last chapter was this. And this is, and I'll be done. Never stop looking. The last thing they said in that book of 100 pages was to never stop looking. There were stories that were woven within that 100-page book. And one of those stories that I read was most interesting. There was a young man by the name of Jacob Wetterling, W-E-T-T-E-R-L-I-N-G, become missing in 1989, little Jacob. His parents posted this message, and this is a message that I leave you with this morning. The posted message said, Dear Jacob, we're still looking for you, and we will never quit. 1989. Jacob, we're still looking for you, and we'll never quit. Now this morning, the message from the Father is that every one of us are like sheep that have gone astray, and we've turned every one into our own way. But the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. But the message is, just like Jacob's mom and daddy posted, we're still looking, and we're never going to quit. We're never going to quit. The Lord looked for 17 years of my life until I finally, finally received him. How many were saved after the age of 17? You were saved after the age of 17 in your life after the age of 17. Anyway, how many have saved on the other side of 17? You were saved younger than 17. There's a bunch of us. Church has a different constitution because of who, how and who, who we soul win with. But it's very interesting when I say this to you, and I'll be done. The Lord is still looking for you. He's not going to quit. And I can unload the truck of the gospel message and the choir and the musicians and and the singers, my friend, can unload the story of the gospel with their hearts, my friend, overflowing themselves of themselves being saved. But it's got to come down to you and your time and your place when you're saved. Here's what I think. I think when we offer to God our religious actions, I think when we offer to God our good things that we do, I think it insults the very heart of God. I think it actually angers God's heart when we offer to him and place my friend of his son. When he sent his son and he died on the cross for his son, with his son, for us, and then we offered to him righteous rags. He said they're just filthy. It, it gives the picture, my friend, of a person that has leprosy and and the leprosy has a real oozing effect, like a tree in the spring with its sap and just literally run out, and soon it becomes stinky and stiff and hard. God said, I want you to know that as I look at them, there's filthy rags. And that's why I said, that's why I said, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and whosoever will, let them say, come. You know what, this morning, the Lord looking for you, and he's not going to quit. How many can say this morning, the Lord found me? And I'm saved and I'm thankful. Can you say amen? amen? I am glad I am saved. I am so glad I've been forgiven. I'm so glad that my friend, my life, is, it's because of what he did and my response to him. You know, there's only so much that God can do. Now watch this. There's only so much God will do. You know, when our kids were little, they were so much fun when they were little. I mean, they were so much fun. You could grab them. Them little boys were ornery. Our girls were almost perfect. They had a lot of words. They couldn't get their mouths to quit. You know, they just always had to say the last word, and that, that wasn't always real good. But the little boys, you could just take those little ornery boys and they'd say, now, sit there. You could pick them up both hands and set them down in the chair. We used to wrestle. I, didn't, I never wanted my boys to be sissies, amen? I just, I want my boys to be just kind of, kind of manly. I think that's what we're supposed to. And so we had wrestled, and every once in a while we'd be in the living room and Shuggy would be in the kitchen and she'd be saying, Danny, 
don't hurt those boys. And those boys would be squeaking. I'd say, be still. Mom's going to make us quit fussing, wrestling. Be still. Quit that sniffling. Amen. Be tough. You can just set the... There came a time over on Rhodes Lane, and I was... And it was Stephen, but Stephen was not little anymore. And all you have to do when we wrestle, the boys and me wrestle, all you got to do is say, I quit, or I've got enough, or tap out. We just quit, you know. But the boys did that, but I'm not going to fix to do that. I might die there, but I'm not going to tap out. You know what I'm trying to say? I might never take another step. And so... Stephen had me in a hold, he had me, my nose was on his chest, and he had his arms and his legs around me, and he was doing a stretch, but my nose was right here. Well, that next morning, I was to fly out to California and speak and flew out to California, and I kept noticing all week my neck and my arm. I thought, man, I must be having, I must be having some kind of something going wrong somewhere, man. It hurt day after day, and I took stuff, trying to, I got back and went to see one of our chiropractors, said, yeah, you got a neck injury. And I said, I know exactly where I got it. Because I had a blue mark right across my nose all week, my friend, where Stephen compressed my nose and pushed it against me. That's the last time I wrestled with him. Amen. That's the last time. Amen. Sugar said, you should have just got out of there. I said, I could have got out of it, but I'd had to hurt him to do it. And she said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> what I'm telling you is that God, God will send his son, but God will not overpower you with him. He will not save you unless you want to be saved. Go to hell if you choose, but you don't have to. Go to hell if you're too stubborn, but you don't have to. You know, the sad thing is we love unsaved people. I love unsaved people. I got good friends that are unsaved people, guys that I love, people that I love. But I can't get saved for only you can get saved for you. You know, most of us in this crowd are saved, but not all of us are saved. Jesus said, Father, is there any way? Is there any way for a man to be saved without me taking their sin and dying for them? Is there any way? Is there any way? And every time he submits and surrender a fresh lay, if it be thy will, nevertheless, thy will be done. So I can see him that day on the cross as he, the stars go and hide, the sun refuses to shine, the earthquakes. It's in that hour when the son has been separated from the father because of your sin and mine so that you and I could stand and say, yes, sir, I've been saved. I've been saved at this place and to this time and my life's been this different because of what Jesus did for me. How are you saved this morning?